Welcome everyone to the Flying V lunch lecture. We are excited for this lunch lecture today. My name is Sangeetha. I am from the TU Delft Energy Club. Uh, let me just say a few words about that. We organize energy related events for students and we have some fun events coming up, including at the Day of Sustainability. And we also have board interest drinks if you might be interested in doing this yourself. So do check out our website, our social media, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, you can find us wherever you want on the internet. And now for today's event, you may have heard of the Flying V, and our speaker for today will be the project leader himself, Dr. Rulof Voss. Uh, Rulof is a assistant professor at the Aerospace Department of TU Delft, and he is leading this project since February of 2019. So it's a very recent and ongoing project. Um, the Flying V is a concept for a plane where the fuselage and wings are fused in a V-shape as opposed to uh, separate. And uh, he can tell you about this probably much better than I can. In fact, there's recently been a scale model with a successful test flight. And now I will hand it over to Rulof. And we will start with a little video. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for uh, inviting me, uh, Sangeeta, to, the, to give this lunch lecture for the Energy Club. I'm uh, very happy to do that. Uh, the title of this uh, lunch lecture is the design of a Flying V subsonic transport. And I started with a little introduction uh, film that is already five years old, but that sparked my interest into this uh, configuration. Uh, you saw the inventor of the, um, um, of the Flying V, uh, flying his scaled model, and we're going to see hopefully at the end of the lecture our scaled model flying as well. Uh, but before we get there, um, let's take a step back and think about what we actually want uh, with um, with aviation in the future. I don't know if some of you might have seen yesterday's uh, uh, event by Airbus, their vision on uh, climate neutrality. But the whole idea here is to have climate neutral com commercial aviation. And I'm putting it in the year 2070 there, but if we could do it earlier, of course, that would be preferred. And from this vision, um, we, we work on various projects and the Flying V project is absolutely one of them. So if we look at energy consumption within um, aviation and we break it down into the various segments, uh, this pie chart gives you a little bit of an idea of where the most energy is being consumed. Of course, energy here in the form of fossil fuels, kerosene. Um, and there's some, some nomenclature in here. So business jets, regional jets, I think most of you know what, what is meant by that. So uh, um, smaller airplanes, basically regional jets only go, uh, go a relatively short distance. And um, uh, think about our Embraers, for example, the small airplanes that, you know, I actually knock my head against the ceiling every time I'm in one of them. Um, turboprops are also in there, but you see all of those only consume a little bit of the total amount of energy. Most of the energy is being consumed by the so-called single aisle and twin aisle aircraft. So the single aisle aircraft, those are the aircraft um, that have passenger seats from 150 to about 180, sometimes a little bit more. 
Um, so you think about your Boeing 737, your Airbus A320, and they take you uh, over somewhat longer distances. So let's say up to uh, uh, up to about 4,000 kilometers. And the twin owl aircraft, those are your large airplanes that take you to, to other continents. Um, and uh, you can see from this chart that the twin owl airplanes really take up about half of the fuel because they're larger and they fly over very long distances. And our typical um, aircraft configuration that we, that we uh, perform these operations with is a turbofan powered um, tube and wing aircraft as we call that. So we have a cigar like tube where the passengers are in and then a wing that carries the, uh, the weight of this, uh, of this tube. Um, and the Airbus A350-900, the one that I'm showing here, has been uh, uh, is a state-of-the-art airplane and has been a reference airplane for the for the flying v to compare the uh, the energy consumption to amongst others so uh, if we really want to make an impact if we really want to do something about uh, making aviation climate neutral we'd better work on these large passenger airplanes and on the single aisle market as they together form the vast majority of energy consumption within the whole aviation sector. So the Flying V targets the largest part of the pie, um, this twin aisle uh, market here. Now, if we look at how do we actually measure efficiency for, uh, uh, for airplanes? So this chart actually shows um, on the vertical axis a metric for efficiency. It's called the payload range efficiency. So it is a very simple formula that basically multiplies the payload weight with the range over which you fly that payload and it divides it by the fuel weight that you burn while uh, performing this mission. And therefore it's, it's actually expressed in, in, in a unit length. In this case, it's nautical miles, a very common uh, uh, unit that we use within, uh, uh, within the uh, aircraft industry. On the horizontal axis, we see the year of introduction and then each data point here represents an individual airplane. And what you can see is that with time, newer airplanes became more and more fuel efficient and therefore the payload range efficiently started to increase quite dramatically. Particularly, all those orange dots are representing airplanes that feature a turbofan or a turboprop engine, where you can see that the introduction of those engines really gave a boost to the payload range efficiency of modern day airplanes. But what you can also see is that we are leveling out here. We are over the last 20 years putting a lot of effort into making airplanes lighter, uh, making engines more fuel efficient and making airplanes more aerodynamic. But that is only giving a very small uh, improvement in the payload range efficiency of these vehicles. So we are plateauing. So the question is if we, re if we on the one hand have this target of reaching um, uh, climate neutral aviation and on the other hand we see that our airplanes are plateauing in terms of their efficiency we realize that something needs to be done here we need to go to different types of technologies in order to to come onto another steep curve uh, in our payload range efficiency and the question that we ask ourselves here at, at uh, the faculty of aerospace engineering is is the Flying V uh, a possible alternative to this tube and wing aircraft? And can it be this, or can it be part of this step change in, uh, in efficiency that would contribute, I say contribute, not solve, but contribute to climate neutral aviation? So the ambition of the Flying V project is to demonstrate unambiguously that the Flying V is both a viable and more energy efficient aircraft configuration compared to the state of the art by the year of 2025. So in a period of about five years, we want to basically tick a lot of boxes to demonstrate that this airplane is viable. Viable means that we think this could be certified, that it's safe, that you can actually operate it safely. And on the other hand, that you know, when we make a lot of design modifications in order to to make it um, certifiable that it still is more energy, energy efficient than the tube and wing aircraft and that the difference is large enough to justify the introduction of such a radical new configuration. So that's where we're trying to aim. 
So what makes what do we think makes the Flying V so great compared to a tube and wing aircraft? Well, first of all, it's d designed with uh, the objective of reducing energy consumption from the very, very start. So it's basically in the DNA of this of this airplane. And I'll talk a little bit about wh what that actually means. We collaborate. I mean, from the very beginning, we've been collaborating for uh, with, for example, KLM, an operator that brings a lot of knowledge to the table. So we design for operation such that not only uh, it is something that uh, a manufacturer can build, but also that an operator wants to fly with uh, and also wants to maintain, because that's also uh, something that is very important for airplanes, that it is maintainable. And of course, designed for production. So we work together with uh, Airbus and they help us in, in, the, in the design. And we look, for example, at uh, um, designing for production. What does that mean? Is that we don't want to over um, um, over complexify. Yeah? So it shouldn't be a very complicated airplane to manufacture because otherwise it gets very, very expensive to, to manufacture. So we want something that is elegant and simple uh, such that the manufacturing costs are um, still in hand, let's say. But the key is here we collaborate, so we don't do this by, by ourselves. Now, in the very beginning, you, you, I showed you a little a movie clip, which is already five years old, but I want to talk a little bit about the origins of the Flying V, because this airplane was uh, designed not at TU Delft for the first, uh, first time, but at Airbus. Uh, so it was a student that did his internship at Airbus FPO, Future Projects Office, uh, in Hamburg. And he actually came up with this flying wing design that could basically do the same as uh, the Airbus A350-900 could. So what does that mean? It could transport 315 passengers over a range of 15,000 kilometers carries 36 LD3 containers, so you see here, at a speed of 85% of the speed of sound, Mach 0.85. And could also do that um, while parking the airplane in the same gate space as the A350, uh, meaning that it was within the 65 meter span limit. Now, what does this airplane look like? The original Flying V design was basically um, uh, a combination of these two fuselage barrels, still circular barrels that were actually borrowed from a, a single aisle airplane, a smaller airplane, an A320. Uh, and what that student, Eustace, Eustace Baynut, what he did is he basically fused these two uh, barrels together in the center to form this characteristic V shape. Behind it, he basically put separate cargo holds, so separate tubes in which he could put the cargo containers. Um, finally, uh, furthermore, he put over the wing engines and winglets with rudders, and those characteristics still remain. And that basically um, led to the claims that this airplane was 10% more, um, uh, had a 10% higher aerodynamic efficiency, which we call L by D, or the lift to drag ratio, and had a 2% reduction in takeoff weight. Um, and these two things were for me the starting point to say, hey, that's interesting. I got an airplane that's both lighter and more fuel efficient or more uh, aerodynamically efficient. So let's also take a look at that. We started at, at uh, doing an independent study. Now, here you see the patent that was filed back in uh, 2015 uh, or 2014, actually, with uh, Justus Beinart as the uh, the inventor, and um, the the patent is actually owned by Airbus. So when we took a shot at it, and that means myself and and two master students, the first thing we did is we we modified the design. So we had. Uh, come up with a different type of fuselage section for the design of blended wing body airplanes, a different type of airplane um, that is also a little bit uh, of a flying wing configuration. But that that uh, cross section of that blended wing body is something that we could also use in the flying V. So what does it what does it consist of? It's basically um, a, a piecewise circular, uh, cross section, if you will. So you see those circular circles that I drew in here, and um, and then we added this rectangular box inside. Now, why do we need a piecewise circular cross section? Well, 
one of the issues we're having with these these flying wings where you put passengers in the wings is when you go to higher altitudes you want to pressurize that cabin um, in order for your passengers to simply breathe right so we need a pressurized cabin but as you know anything that you inflate uh, that you that you put pressure on wants to become a circle by itself by nature right so that's why it's so efficient to to have these circular tubes as fuselages because when you pressurize them they don't change shape by themselves so it's a very very uh, uh, weight efficient structure so for um, for low weight we can actually construct this uh, this uh, circular fuselage barrel now if you that's also the reason that just put these circular barrels inside that wing the only issue with that is that um, when you want to design um, the wing let's say the front part of the wing you only have one desire design variable to work with you only have the the radius of that tube to work with so not a whole lot of design freedom furthermore the tube was actually fairly long so you had uh, uh, a lot of seats behind each other and that makes that the, the passenger sit, sitting all the way in the back would be rather far away from the center axis of the plane. So when the airplane would make a rolling motion, the passenger would experience quite a lot of um, acceleration. Yeah, so it wouldn't be very pleasant. So what we, what we said is instead of a, uh, a, a six abreast cabin with six seats next to each other, we make a 10 abreast cabin. So 10 seats next to each other and we shift all the people a little bit more forward into this wider cabin and we make an oval cross section. So an oval is basically a piecewise circular cross section. Now this is notionally what that looks like. So we have 10 uh, seats next to each other and we use that um, that those that box structure inside to basically keep the shape of that oval structure. Um, so the horizontal members are loaded in compression and the vertical members are loaded in tension. The horizontal member here then also doubles as the floor and the horizontal member here on the upper upper side also doubles as the beam where you hang the overhead beams from. So that was a sort of uh, our own invention and it's not unlike the uh, the lower deck of the Airbus A380 in terms of the cabin design. Now what does that look like inside the flying V-wing? Well something like this. And here you can also see a little bit our our design process here. So on the floor you see what I, you know, drafted on the two-dimensional uh, paper, let's say. And then here you can see what that looks like in 3D and what this oval fuselage section would could actually look like in reality. So from the from the cross section we go to the floor plan. What does that look like? And uh just to give you already a little bit of a, a preview here we're not just designing one airplane we're designing a whole family of airplane consisting of three members and i'm showing you here the floor plan of the largest member there's some some nomenclature in here but it's the the why do i look at the largest member because that is the one that is most constrained by for example the gate dimensions at the airport so here's what the floor plan now looks like for the uh, the Flying V-100. This one actually uh, fits about 360 people in. It has large containers that are actually now located behind the passenger uh, compartment. It features a very large central galley in the middle of the airplane. Um, and then you can see a business class section and an and a economy class section. Now we use standardized pitch, very similar to what Airbus proposes for their A350 in their uh, um, uh, in their documentation. So 55 inch for the um, um, business class seats and uh, 32 inch for the economy class seats. And for those of you that are paying really good attention here, you see that I tilted those seats just a little bit. So they, they get a little bit staggered with respect to each other. And that is necessary in order to comply with the regulations that state that an, uh, a person in a seat may not be more than 18 degrees, uh, rotated 18 degrees with respect to the flight direction of the aeroplane. Well, if you would be sitting next to the leading edge here, you would actually be rotated by 26 degrees. So we had to derotate those chairs a little bit, which also gives them a little bit of stagger. Now that also means that the seat takes up a little bit more space in terms of the width than, or, uh, than a normal uh, tender breast uh, cabin and that makes the cabin also a little bit wider. 
Behind you see 18 LD9 containers. Those are the largest containers we have. Um, and furthermore, we have lavatories, we have galleys, and we have emergency exits. So those are the red um, parts there that need to be free. Now let's put that one a little bit in perspective to, to the A350-1000. You see the dash 1000 floor plan here, but also the deck of the cargo. And let's make a comparison between the two. Now this airplane actually has more passengers, 369 on a floor area of 314 square meters, uh, resulting in 1.18 passengers per square meter. We have 361 passengers, but a larger floor area. So we actually can only fit 1.08 passenger per square meter. So we are a little bit behind here because the Flying V has 8% less passengers per unit floor area. And I put an exclamation mark there because it's not good. You know, preferably it would be, it would be the same, but it gets a little bit tricky when you have to merge these two cabins here in the middle and you see some more white space appearing. Now, from a passenger's point of view, this might not be bad because it also gives you as a passenger 8% more space and uh, floor space in this cabin. So there's also an upside there. Now, from an aerodynamics point of view, we know that the, uh, the aerodynamic performance or the aerodynamic efficiency of the airplane is very important for the fuel efficiency of the airplane. It's not the only component, but it is important. So the first thing that we did is modify the plan form shape uh, compared to the plan form shape that Baynot had actually proposed to demonstrate that you could have a uh, improved lift to drag ratio compared to uh, an A350. And based on these, uh, these simulations that we did back in 2016, we said, okay, we could expect a, a, a maybe a 15% increase uh, in an aerodynamic efficiency compared to the Airbus A350. And that was even more than that Eustace had actually uh, proposed in his very first uh, design. Now, other aerodynamic investigations, I will not go into all of them, but this is an interesting one. Where do you position that engine? That engine has a major impact on, the, on lots of things. So for example, on the, the weight and balance of the airplane, but also on the aerodynamic interference between the, the engine and the main wing. You can basically see here in the red area, we get very high speeds. Um, so that, that basically, that study prompted us to put the, uh, the um, the location of the engine a little bit to the rear part of the uh, of the wing. A second thing that was very challenging for this airplane is the integration of the landing gear. Uh, as you might have seen, this airplane has fairly long uh, landing gear. I'll show a, a film in just uh, a little bit. Um, and that's because the airplane doesn't have any high lift devices, no flaps um, like an ordinary airplane has. So it has to actually go to very high attitudes in order to take off and land. And if you don't want to scrape the tip on, on, the, on the runway, whenever you go to these high attitudes, you therefore need very uh, long landing gear legs and a complicated uh, retraction me mechanism, as you can see here. So those are some of the uh, things that we worked on. Sorry, this goes all wrong. Uh, and this is a little, little video that basically shows you um, what the airplane could look like when it's at, at, parked at an airport. So that looks very, very good. But one thing we still haven't, uh, we still haven't really looked into yet, and that's the weight of this airplane. And, and here's another advantage of this, this so-called flying wing design. You distribute the weight at the location where you're also producing the lift. And that's something that 
took a little longer to assess, to be honest. It was quite uh, quite some work. This was mostly carried out at, at the Future Projects office at Airbus, but we performed actually a preliminary structural design to compare a tube and wing aircraft like the A350 to a flying wing airplane like the uh, the flying V to compare how uh, what how much structural weight you would need to support the same load. Um, and here we have the advantage, just like we do on the blended wing body, and this is the picture for the blended wing body, that we distribute the weight over the width of the airplane. So we distribute it laterally, and that actually turns out to, uh, to have a major impact on the weight because we demonstrated through that study that we had a 17% reduction in the so-called FEM weight. So that's the uh, FEM stands for finite element method, and it's the analysis method that you use to to analyze this, uh, uh, this this structure that I just showed. So, based on this this uh, very preliminary uh, uh, structural design, we were already able to to really see that this airplane is is uh, without uh, a doubt going to be lighter than uh, a tube and wing airplane. And when we had both improved aerodynamic efficiency, so we had uh, tested that and we had reduction in, in structural weight, we knew that this airplane was going to be more fuel efficient. So how much more fuel efficient? So here's sort of a build up of what we see in terms of fuel efficiency and where that comes from. So the first thing that we see, if we start with an A350, is that due to the fact that we cannot pack as many passengers on that floor, that we get a reduced reduction in uh, efficiency due to the lower uh, payload weight. Now, the first thing uh, that that is a difference between the two airplanes is the fact that the flying V is a little bit smaller. So it has a four and a half percent reduction in wetted area. So the outside is smaller and that uh, increases the efficiency by three percent. Because we have this huge winglets at the tip, at the flying V um, that double as vertical tails, uh, we get a 10% boost in, um, in fuel efficiency or energy efficiency. And um, the reduction in structural weight translates in another 6% improvement in um, uh, energy efficiency. And finally, if we reduce the, uh, the harmonic range, that's the range at maximum pay payload by 750 kil kilometers, we could increase the um, efficiency even more. That means that the design range of the flying V is still the same as the A350. So with these 360 passengers, it feel, still flies over those 15,000 kilometers. And then when you do the math, you see that indeed you get very close to that 20% of increase in, in payload range efficiency. And it's very, very traceable. So there's very little magic involved here. Now, I already uh, alluded to it before the flying V distinguishes itself from other flying wing designs because it's not just one airplane, it's a family of airplanes. And you can take out um, components from, let's say this constant cross section in the outer wing, stick the wings back together and get to a smaller family member. And this way we range between 290 and 360 seats between the smallest and the largest family member. All right, also with respect to, to going towards uh, climate neutral aviation, we might need to resort to different fuels. Now, the oval fuselage cross section that I talked about in the beginning would also be an excellent candidate as a non circular pressurized fuel tank in which you can store cryogenic fuels like hydrogen, but also. Um, liquid natural gas could be a candidate here, which by itself, when burning, it already reduces the, the CO2 um, um, production by 25%. Um, what would we do then? I mean, there's no free lunch here when we do uh, hydrogen storage. It's, it's going to uh, eat up a lot of our internal volume. So here you can see, for example, that part of the uh, 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 cargo compartment is basically used as a, a hydrogen tank. And that could be an option where we, we basically reduce the, uh, uh, the useful internal volume uh, for passenger and cargo and assign that volume to this pressurized tank. So there you have uh, basically a flying fuel tank. And that's something that we're currently looking into together with one master student um, that's doing his thesis on this and a group of uh, students that are doing a, a master's, um, well, a JIP, a joint interdisciplinary project on this topic 
under the leadership of, uh, amongst others, Airbus. Right, so as we're dealing with a, with a totally new concept, the, uh, all of the aspects need to be rethought, including, for example, the design of the cockpit. And this is one of the studies that we're currently performing to look at, you know, what is different than a flying V if you want to be able to fly this airplane and coming at very, very high nose, nose high attitudes and the pilot still being able to, to look outside the window. This turns out to be a non-trivial task, but it's just one of the examples of the things that we're currently looking into. Um, now, this video basically gives you an idea of what the inside of the flying vehicle is. And there you also saw some unconventional concepts for the for the cabin as we are working very closely together with the industrial design engineering faculty uh, under the leadership of Peter Vink, who is looking at cabin comfort for, for passengers. And this is one of the important parts of the project as well, because um, we, don't, we don't only want to reduce um, the energy consumption of the airplane, and we don't want to do it at the cost of reduction in comfort. So preferably we, we want to increase the level of comfort of passengers. Uh, and, and those two things could sometimes bite each other a little bit. So it's good to keep those things, uh, to, to include both aspects when you're designing a new uh, airplane like the Flying V. Now, a couple of things uh, I want to highlight here in terms of the, the research that we're doing. Um, we have lots of nonlinear aerodynamics over this wing. The wing itself, if you look at the flying, wing as, flying V as a flying wing, um, has very interesting flow characteristics, more akin to a fighter uh, than to a transport aircraft. So definitely something to look into. Here you see a beautiful picture of oil flow over the wing that indicates some, uh, some interesting flow features. Um, so in summary, just a couple of things that, um, that I want to highlight here. The, 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 the medium version of this airplane designed for 315 passengers with an oval fuselage, winglets that double as vertical tails, control surfaces that are multifunctional at the trailing edge, something that we're also currently looking into. Um, another thing here, complementary to propulsion innovation. So I don't know what the future is going to hold for propulsion. Uh, it's probably going to be some form of a turbofan here that's going to com combust a, um, uh, a fuel, whether that's kerosene, uh, synthetic kerosene or, uh, or hydrogen or LNG. That's complementary to the innovation that I'm showing here. So all of these percentages also have nothing to do with changing the um, uh, the propulsion system. An important feature is the stretchable fuselage and um, uh, maybe uh, something to keep in mind here, what are we promoting is the 20% less fuel consumption of this airplane compared to uh, a tube and wing version that would do exactly the same with, with uh, the exact same engines. Um, before we go to the last film, because uh, that's that's very exciting, that's the, the flight test. Um, I want to say something about the uh, the project that we've been running for the past one and a half years under the support of KLM it was uh, was a great project to to work in. I uh, had a great team of uh, people to work on uh, on uh, the aerospace engineering side: uh, Malcolm Brown, Daniel Etherstone, and uh, Alberto Ruiz. 
Um, and then our, our pilot Nando van Arnhem did a fantastic job. And I also want to thank Peter Vink and his team on the other side, uh, Industrial Design Engineering. They built a, a great mock-up of the Flying V cabin that could really let people experience what it would be like to sit into a in a Flying V airplane. Let's take a look at that last video. Ready? Are you ready, Albert? Yes, we are ready. Five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, fifteen, twenty, twenty-two. In the air. I continue. stressful work to reach this moment and then to have it confirmed that it flies all of that hard work uh, it was it was worth putting in all of the hours making sure everything's correct and built properly built accurately uh, and it pays off i think we're all happy we're happy that, that we succeeded and achieved the goal of flying the flying the flying team. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention and would like to answer your questions if you have any. Yeah, so I will read out some questions. We got quite a number of questions. Um, so maybe let's start with uh, what Purvi asks, what kind of cargo will this plane be transporting? Is it mainly people or could it also be food, for example? Doesn't matter. So uh, it's a passenger designed as a passenger airplane, uh, but as with many passenger airplanes, they can be also converted to an all cargo airplane. Uh, I currently we, we currently have it designed with a large cargo door for LD9 containers. Like I said, those are the largest containers there are. Um, <clears throat> so you could convert it into an all freighter, and then you can take whatever you want, fruit, vegetables, perishable goods, or not. Doesn't matter. Okay. Um, thank you. And adding to that, we got a couple of repeated questions. How does the Flying V affect passenger comfort? Because the range of motion will be larger in the wings than with a conventional aircraft. Yeah, indeed. So that's, uh, I, and this is again referring to the accelerations that passengers are experiencing when the airplane is rolling. So uh, that is something that we, we looked at from the beginning and it was also part of the reason that we moved the, cab the passenger cabin forward and, and that the, 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 the freight, the cargo experienced the, the largest accelerations. Uh, we know from previous research on blended wing bodies that we are well within uh, the limits uh, in terms of the distance from the center line that, that, can, that still allows for comfortable flight. And um, you should also keep in mind that we are only rolling a few times during a, during a typical, typical long haul flight. So it's also something that is um, for a relatively short duration compared to a, to a 10 hour flight, for example. All right, thank you. Um, then George asks, is there any relation between the Flying V and the recently unveiled Airbus 0E blended wing body concept in terms of layout and efficiency? So the, the, there is a relation in the sense that the, 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 the Maverick or the, the blended wing body airplane that was shown yesterday 
uh, doesn't have a tail either, <laughs> nor does the, the flying V. So both of them are uh, flying wing concepts, if you will, tailless. Um, but there's also a lot of difference between the two. So the, the blended wing body uh, concept that we also studied uh, in, in, the, in the recent past, let's say, um, uh, is, is a little bit different from the, from the flying V uh, in the sense that it's not easy to stretch and make a family of. So that was one of the key features that the flying V has. You can cut out constant sections and glue it back together and, and end up with a, a smaller version. Um, in terms of the passenger uh, passenger cabin, it's also a little bit different. So we basically have these two um, uh, two parts of the of the cabin, one in each uh, each leg of the V, and then the uh, blended wing body. You're basically sitting in more of a, a theater configuration in in the center part of the of the blended wing body. Um, I mean, the overall idea is is very similar in the sense that you're trying to to use the um, or, or create an airplane with lower uh, exterior area, we call it wetted area, uh, for the same interior volume, and that's something that the blended, blended wing body and the flying V definitely share. So there's a couple of um, similarities and also a couple of important differences there. Okay, great, thanks. Um, then someone else asked, have you tried to compare the flying V with other disruptive configurations such as box wing? Um, so typically, no, we have not. So typically what we do is we compare to a reference airplane that uh, that has the same, um, that has sort of the conventional um, configuration. And then the box wing has been also compared to this conventional configuration. Um, so, uh, I don't have the all the numbers for the box wing design, but I, I can tell you this. So the box wing design um, is, is designed to limit the the lift induced drag, right? So it has this this wing that goes from the um, uh, from the fuselage, makes this round all the way to the back, and therefore reduces the the lift induced drag and improves the aerodynamic efficiency of the airplane. But there's a penalty. There's a weight penalty. So uh, that that is so great about the flying V, I believe is that it comes with an improved uh, aerodynamic efficiency and a weight benefit. Uh, and that is something that you hardly ever see when you introduce new new technologies on an airplane, that it's sort of on two very important fronts gives you this benefit. Um, all right, thanks. Um, then there are some questions, um, for example, what kind of changes will be required for airport ports to perform maintenance and will there be new programs in the cockpit for takeoff and landing? So regarding the maintenance uh, questions, uh, this is also something that uh, we involved KLM in, in, the, in the design of this airplane. So I, for example, did one day of line maintenance on the Boeing 787 just to check out for myself, you know, what kind of things do you need to do you need to look out for? Um, and also, we discussed this uh, not only line maintenance, so on the platform, let's say, at the gate, but also in the hangar. Um, one of the key challenges there is the location of the engine. With the engine high up, uh, the question was, okay, if we need to replace an engine, this happens every now and then, a couple of times per year, uh, an engine breaks down when an airplane is actually away from Schiphol, let's say, <laughs> and then you got to replace the engine. What are you going to do if you're at an outstation? Uh, you have very little uh, tooling available. How can you get that engine out? So that is something that uh, that we uh, what we also addressed in the design of, for example, the engine integration. So so far we have not identified any showstoppers. Um, there are some challenges on the platform in terms of reaching uh, the airplane. It's it's a lot more higher up on its legs, so you might need uh, some additional. Uh, uh, lifts to reach the airplane or lifts that actually go a little bit higher than the ones you typically have. We do, uh, we did um, design the airplane such that the, the, the deck would be low enough for conventional cargo lifts to reach that deck to put the cargo into the airplane. Um, so those are some considerations that we did take into account already. And then the second part of your question was relating to the, sorry, takeoff and landing procedures. Can you repeat that one more? Once more. Uh, yes, one second. Um, yeah, so the takeoff and landing procedures would be different. Just um, do the programs and the hardware in the cockpit need to be different from conventional planes for this? 
No, I don't think so. Uh, the takeoff procedure as a procedure will be will be the same, but the, the the way it is carried out is a little bit different. So like I said, there is no flaps on the airplane. We did design it for the same uh, uh, approach speed so it can nicely get in line with other airplanes and come into the airport at the same speed uh, without going faster or slower than any of the other uh, airplanes that are in line. That was a very important uh, top level requirement for the airplane. Um, as it doesn't have any flaps, you also saw it a little bit in the movie of the of the scale flight test model. Uh, you're going to have quite some some steep angle at, at which you are uh, uh, climbing. So uh, in, in the model airplane actually might uh, might be a little bit much on that on that first flight, but it will be a lot higher than on a conventional airplane. So imagine you you'd be more like in the Concorde, for example. It's very similar to that, where you actually go to a high attitude before actually. Um, go becoming airborne, and then that is, I think, very different both for passenger experience, uh, but also for pilots. Uh, so as the wheels touch down on landing, the pilot is going to be actually sitting more than 20 meters up in the air, away from the away from the runway. He's physically far away from the runway, and that's going to be a, a different experience from a pilot's perspective. Okay, exciting. Uh, and then we have a few more questions related to the center of gravity and stability and controllability, especially during takeoff and landing. Shoot. So could you explain a bit more about the safety and stability aspects when you take off and land? Right, so you could see in the, in the video the takeoff was, was taped, so you, you could see that the airplane can take off, uh, but the CG position is very critical. I, I, that's, that's absolutely the case. It was one of the main questions we had going into the, the flight test, go, where did the, should the CG reside in order for the airplane to be uh, stable throughout the entire flight? And I think uh, in hindsight, we should have put it a little bit more forward. Uh, but still, you know, we've already looked at the data coming from that video or from that flight test and the airplane, even at that CG position, was still stable. Uh, in, in next flights, we want to put it a little bit more forward. In terms of the dynamic stability, we saw that there was a strong yaw roll coupling. So, um, hang on, I'm going to get my flying V here, <laughs> the video camera. So, uh, basically, a yawing is this motion about the vertical axis, and rolling is basically this motion. And there's a very strong coupling between the two. Uh, and that is something we need to address uh, to get the good handling qualities for the pilot. And those two things are very important to get the airplane certified in the end. Uh, I think based on the flight test, we are very confident that we can do this. I mean, this was just the first try and it was already looking very, very good from a stability and control point of view. Control was actually excellent. Uh, we had a lot of control authority on this airplane. So there's really in that in that just from a qualitative point of view, without looking at any of the numbers, we can already say that this is doable. And if it's doable on such a small scale model, it's definitely doable on a much larger, uh, larger airplane. Um, then with respect to the CG shift, because that is definitely a worry. We have cargo in the back, we have passengers in the front. So that means once you know you, you park the airplane at the gate, all the passengers rush out, uh, but the cargo is still in there. And if the cargo is heavy, that might tip the airplane on its tail. It doesn't have a tail, but you, you, you get the sort of you get the idea, right? Something that's definitely unwanted. So this is uh, this is for sure something to uh, to wor to not worry about, but to think about. And um, in one of our workshops, um, actually one of the Airbus uh, designers came up with an idea to lock the landing gear, for example, the, the landing gear bogey, because it has a, a four wheel bogey. Uh, and that could help, for example, in mitigating this, uh, this effect. So it won't tilt anymore about the pivot point on the bogey, but it would tilt about the, the main wheel, the rear wheel, and that is further back than uh, than that pivot point and so 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 far we've identified a lot of these these issues but none of them have actually sparked us to say hey this is really this is uh, insurmountable we cannot overcome this so so far we've we've always found let's say uh, a, a relatively easy way to uh, to solve these issues issues that doesn't mean that they won't come up i mean in, in there might be still things that um that might be insurmountable. And, and one of the things is, for example, passenger evacuation. So can you get everybody out within a, within a, an, um, a 90 second time frame, which is required by the authorities? Question mark, we don't know. Um, so this is definitely something to, uh, to investigate further. 
All right, thank you. Um, maybe in terms of time, we will limit it to just one more question, I think. Uh, so could you give some future perspective? What are the biggest challenges right now? And if everything goes well, when could we expect to be sitting in a flying V? Right, so just to, to start with the latter part of the question, um, we I believe that we still need about 10 more years for decent research before we can start to do development, right? So uh, research still needs to carry out a lot, a lot of these basic aspects. Uh, I, I said in the beginning, viability and energy efficiency, those are our two prime question marks. So can we convince ourselves and others that this airplane is actually can actually be flown just as safe as current airplanes uh, are today? Uh, and can we also convince ourselves that this can be a profitable a vehicle for operators and manufacturers because those things in the end are also important and if we if we do does this energy efficiency gain of 20 percent that we started with is that still there or has that sort of decreased to four percent and and therefore has not has, has very little meaning anymore those are the first things that we need to carry out in, in let's say the, the coming decade to answer those very fundamental questions if those are answered positively, only then one can start to say, uh, yes, we, we take the chance and we're going to develop a completely unconventional airplane. And I suspect that the, that the 10 years that it took to develop the A350 from the design, from the, the, the moment the decision was taken to actually build the airplane till the time that it actually flew for the first time, I mean, that we will need that same amount of time at least for the Flying V as well. So that means that the airplane will not be in, in, uh, in flight before the year 2040, which coincidentally is also the, the, the year when the first A350s are going to be phased out because they're going to be produced for an extending, uh, extended period of time. Um, and then to the, the first part of the question, what are the most uh, burning challenges, and, and there's a lot of them. We, we just um, finished the second workshop, uh, the research, um, the second research workshop on the Flying V, where we come together with partners to discuss uh, our research findings and to identify uh, the challenges. And we have a so-called research roadmap of um, all the things that we still want to do. And I think it touches on about 70 different items ranging from, you know, passenger evacuation to uh, uh, handling qualities, uh, to uh, uh, structural details that still need to be worked out. So lots of challenges still there. All right, thank you. Sounds very exciting. Uh, considering the time, I think we can wrap up now. But thank you very much. Um, yeah, and have a nice day, the rest of you. All right, thank you too. Goodbye, everyone.